The Mysterious Comet Chapter 1 New Atmospherics Celestial in Origin Weather conditions figure so prominently and continually in our lives that few among us pause to consider the fons et origo of the atmosphere we breathe or the rain that descends sometimes as a blinding and furious storm, at others as a gentle shower. The state of the weather is always a subject of interest and often of importance, but not many can advance an intelligent explanation of it. We accept the occurrence of great storms, gales, hurricanes, tornadoes, blizzards or severe frosts without as a rule probing deeper than to explain that the barometer has fallen or that a depression has arrived. Why these things have happened is not a problem the average man can solve. In the same way, if there should be a prolonged period of intense heat, drought or a suffocating heat wave, no explanation is forthcoming other than an anticyclone has arrived off our shores, though why it has prevailed no one knows. Sometimes such an anticyclone is suddenly and rudely dispersed by a sudden flaming tempest from the northeast, but why it has come from that direction or what has originated the tempest remains a veiled mystery, even to our meteorological authorities. The explanation offered is that all atmospheric changes or movements are initiated by events having their genesis outside our Earth. A passing shower of rain can conceivably be the final culmination of a movement that began long before in some planet in a far solar system, the last, the last expiring gasp of a world which has ceased to exist. Earthquakes or eruptions are inav invariably accompanied by violent atmospheric disturbances, and these may, and frequently do, set up a sequence of storms or weather abnormalities not only in the actual vicinity, but over a wide area far distant from the epicenter of the disturbance. And these atmospheric upsets may continue until gradually the new atmospherics are distributed and shaken out, are picked up by normal air currents, absorbed and then dissipated. And in the same way as a fresh body of water is absorbed by a surrounding lake or seas. How is it that any earthquake in, say, Sicily may entirely change the weather and wind in the north of Europe? Weather abnormalities in their inception reveal conditions which are quite foreign to any local origin and must be sought elsewhere. Those who preserve records of periods of acute atmospheric disturbances are aware that the weather, when it remains fine and tranquil over a certain time, coincides with an absence of any severe earthquake or volcanic eruption. And alternatively, when a severe earthquake is reported, say, in the Mediterranean area or in the direction of Central America, there is a repercussion shortly after or simultaneously producing storms, perhaps snow and great cold, and atmospheric disturbances generally over a big region to the north of the trouble. The explanation, as stated, is that an earthquake or eruption or tornado, or tidal wave, are set in motion by a meteoric body from outer space. This body, either striking the Earth and causing a catastrophe, great or small, according to circumstances, or it may pass on shedding only some of its gases. It is strange that, as yet, official meteorologists seem to be quite indifferent to these facts, or to evis the slightest inclination to associate meteors with the very phenomenon I shall prove they set up. The fact that a meteor, even of comparatively small size, some even a few tons, approaches the Earth at a, stup a stupendous rate of speed generates electricity on a vast scale and is accompanied by gases that at once condense as they strike the air, is evidently regarded as a negligible matter by these authorities, although I do not know why. A word about the appearance of a meteor. These bodies shoot through our atmosphere at such a rapid speed that the human eye cannot fix them by daylight except by a thin cloud or by night except as a flash of light. But when a meteor strikes the earth or sea, it plunges rapidly down like a gigantic flexible shell or torpedo. Falling, perhaps, it would be more correct to say in a serpentine form. Very important point there, serpentine. Bear that in the back of your mind when you 
think about religions and cults. If it should unfortunately strike a ship at sea, she will never again be heard of. Or if it should strike a village or town, such a centre of civilization will be usually buried deep or be torn to tatters. If it be drawn into a volcano by the magnetic attraction offered by these strange mountains, the mountain will burst all unexpectedly into violent paro... How do you say this? Paro... Oximal, paroximal eruption, and all the evidence points to the institution of a new crater or else a long burning fissure down the mountain's flank. Sometimes a meteor, as will be seen, is thrown down as a new and fiercely burning volcanic mountain, sometimes as a volcanic island if it strikes the sea and is big enough to exceed the ocean depths, and sometimes when it is not of sufficient size to appear above the tumultuous sea, we only hear of some tremendous hurricane destroying everything in its path and accompanied by a tidal wave. The present state of scientific thought still clings to the archaic idea that all such events originate in the interior of the earth and are caused by the settling down of the earth's crust during the process of its core cooling, for it is yet a cardinal belief of our period that the Earth's interior is in a state of incandescence. Hence, earthquakes are deemed the outcome of this cooling process. Volcanoes are thrown up from the bowels of the Earth by a like process, and tidal waves are the visible effect of a submarine earthquake. I am sorry not to be able to subscribe word to this belief. Ignorance of the true process, unfortunately, leads often to the loss of life, which would otherwise not happen. The Martinesque disaster of 1902 is a case in point, when the capital, Saint-Pierre, was suddenly destroyed by a great meteor which struck the volcano mont Pelly. Many preliminary warnings had been given beforehand, but the university authorities ridiculed the idea of any danger, and when the inhabitants showed signs of panic, the city was surrounded by a cordon of soldiers and any attempts to escape from it were sternly repressed. In a moment of time, every living being in Saint-Pierre was killed outright by the track of the meteor which struck the mountain, and the remainder passed just over the city and plunged into the harbour where the sea became boiling and all ships. All shipping was also destroyed. If the authorities had understood the signs of meteorism, they would have evacuated Saint-Pierre, which invited destruction as it lay southwest of the volcano. The destruction of St. Pierre, as Professor Hale, the well-known American astronomer, said at the time in one of the Hearst journals, which sent him to investigate the cause of the disaster, was just the same as the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah and hundreds of other cities, as would one day destroy the earth. And as one... Um, hang on. And as would one day destroy the earth. Okay. The view was held by the wise men of old, the Chaldeans, Phoenicians, Hellenes, Druids, and other world teachers. But most of their lore was destroyed by the early church when every form of, quote, pagan science was ruthlessly oppressed. It was not knowledge accessible to all. Indeed, the facts of eschatology were only unfolded to the highest orders in the ancient mysteries of initiation. Yet in many myths the truth was handed down. The idea of Satan and his angels fighting with God in the heavens and being flung down on the earth and buried in Hades was one such myth. The story of Phaeton, who drove his father, Helios's chariot, too near the sun and was flung by Zeus into the river Eridanus was another. The evil devil Set, or Typhon, who was hurled into the underworld after a terrible contest with Horus is another such legend of the same meaning. The destruction of pagan knowledge was a great loss to the world. For though, the, for through the centuries when the Church of Rome became supreme, her aim was to suppress all knowledge other than her doctrines, with the result that science dared not lift its head during the Dark Ages, when any discovery was regarded as heresy. Men like Copernicus suffered persecution, and we are aware that for long the popes refused to admit the existence of land across the Atlantic. And when it was recognised, 
laid it for a time under a ban because it was thought to be spiritually ruled by the devil himself. Well, looking at the state of America nowadays, I'm not so sure it, it isn't. The practical importance of meteorism as a science concerned with the origin, growth and future existence of our Earth cannot be overstated. It is no academic subject for the human race are dependent on it for their well-being or otherwise. It is true that <clears throat> mankind is powerless to divert in any way these messengers of the Almighty, but they can often take steps to escape from a threatened region. I believe that the ancient world are rather the highest placed of that time were made aware in advance of the impending disaster called the flood and that they took steps beforehand to prepare a means of escape this great urge was i suggest the real explanation of the pyramids of egypt and elsewhere and by the way if you ever play the assassin's creed games <laughs> it points exactly to this an ancient civilization that knew something was about to happen but there you go well it's just entertainment folks uh no need to pay attention here. Oh, it's all just a story. Yeah, it is just a story, but where did that story come from? In Egypt, Mexico and Peru, an ancient and scientific race of mariners built pyramids and all on the same general principle, although some were more perfect in their structure and perfection of details than others. The impulse which caused these great edifices to be erected is mentioned by Josephus and confirmed in the book of Genesis that Nimrod, tyrant of Babylon built a pyramid or tower, quote, too high for the waters to be able to reach if God should be minded to drown the world. Antiquity of the Jews. I'm not going to go into the rest of that, trying to point out exactly which chapter it was because I don't quite understand it. Those who think that pyramids were erected as tombs are ignorant of the history of the time such structures were built and of the Egyptian customs to bury their dead in hidden places to prevent their mummies from being rifled by thieves. A pyramid, vast landmark, at once would offer every incitement to the tomb robber. The pyramids, and the Great Pyramid in particular, will, were built as places of refuge when the day of destruction from the heavens occurred and were designed as places of protection if there were earthquakes shattering ordinary dwellings, fiery rocks flung down from the skies as a deluge of water. The Great Pyramid, for example, was built, like the others, of an almost solid core of rock, so carefully welded together that it offered a strong resistance to any outside manifestations. Its basis so immense was yet clamped in its foundations to the virgin rock, so as to give it the maximum of stability in the event of an earthquake shaking these foundations. This enormous mass standing four square over so vast an area tapers to the headstone, or where the headstone should be, an edifice perfectly designed to withstand an invasion of rocks and stones from heaven. Inside, towards the centre, are the king's and the queen's chambers, with a lofty gallery, also devised that it would require a tremendous abulsion to penetrate the stupendous core all cemented together and destroy these places of refuge and at the worst are the and at the worst the king or archmagus might seek refuge in a huge stone sarcophagus in the king's chamber to approach the king or queen's chambers the only two apartments in this mammoth edifice entrance was made by a comparatively small stone door some way up the outside of the pyramid airtight and watertight so perfectly fitted to the surrounding stones that it was extremely difficult to find. After entering, there was a steep descending passage from which, at a certain distance, opened up the ascending passage, formerly blocked by three enormous granite plugs. There's various other theories about the Great Pyramid as well. There's one that is uh, Noah's Ark. Uh, there's another one that it's Mount Sinai described in the Bible. I believe Ralph Ellis subscribes to that theory. When it was realised that at a certain date, say about the 16th century BC, the wise men of the world realised by their knowledge of astronomy and meteorology an impending destruction of all things by fire from heaven, an earthquake and a great flood, they set to work on building vast refuges in stone. If the aftermath of the visitation caused a great flood at Giza, despite the situation and sandy soil, 
the weather, supposing it to penetrate via the entrance, could not force its way. The water, sorry, supposing it to penetrate via up the entrance, uh, could not force its way up the ascending passage owing to the granite plugs. The base of the Queen's Chamber is about 63 feet above the base of the pyramid, and that of the King's Chamber about 133 feet, but the air channel of the King's Chamber is over 250 feet up the pyramid. The Queen's a little lower, but curiously enough, the air channel to the Queen's Chamber had never been opened up at the last five inches, as though the builders did not wish to complete it unless needed. At any rate, the refugees in the event of a flood would be safe in the king's chamber unless it rose to a stupendous height exceeding 250 feet. Also, the roof of the king's chamber consists of no fewer than five granite blocks with cushion blocks between each, the whole surmounted by a huge protective cap of two jointed sloping stones, the object of the whole being to protect the king's chamber from any threatening invasion from the skies or for any such stones crashing down from heaven, such as destroyed Babylon, would have to break through these many buffer roofs to enter the king's chamber. Thus, in every way, the Great Pyramid was erected by a former race of men primarily for utilitarian purposes, to save the elect of the day of the anticipated destruction. Why should we not realise these matters and prepare also? I can cite instance of loss of life and property caused solely by the abysmal ignorance which exists of the true principles of meteorology. We must begin with a searching inquiry into weather conditions and examining specific instances on record of definite occurrences. We may allow at the start of the of the norm of sorry, we may allow at the start that the normal condition of things on the earth is fine weather with the sun shining by day and the stars and the moon by night. A state described by meteorologists as an anti-cyclone, sunny and clear. When cyclonic conditions prevail, there is something abnormal, as there is if we experience continuous rain over a long period, as so happened in the first few months of 1931. We are told that in the flood it rained without ceasing for 40 days, an obviously abnormal condition, as also after the Tokyo earthquake of 1923. It poured a deluge for 14 days, thus a state of being anti-cyclone is normal and is not a movable quantity like, say, a shallow depression that for some reason appears and obscures the anti-cyclone by imposing new atmospherics after which the static, normal, fine conditions are resumed. It is true that, owing to certain conditions, some parts of the Earth are subject to far more, quote, to depressions than anticyclones, until the former might almost be called normal. Such is the state usually found in the Straits of Magella, and in places like Newfoundland or Iceland, or even the British Isles, especially the Outer Hebrides, but geographical situations, the Gulf Stream, wind and sea currents all play a part in these matters. They make no difference to the principle that fine unclouded conditions are normal and therefore an anticyclone does not approach or stretch when a depression moves on or exhausts itself. The normal weather, namely fine, merely returns until once more it is disturbed by a depression, deep or shallow. How do meteorologists explain a not uncommon occurrence of a sudden change in wind and weather from one extreme to another? We will presume that the prevailing southwest wind is growing gently across our islands. The skies are blue, and here and there a shower may take place, this being to all intents and purposes a normal state of affairs. Suddenly, almost a matter of seconds, there is a rapid and dramatic change. The wind swings round to the northeast, accompanying a big fall in the barometer. And a violent storm takes place, often with thunder and lightning, in clement conditions generally, and for weeks the weather is upset or abnormal. What is the cause of all this? Where does the storm originate in, or in the northeast? From whence does it gather its power to defeat at once the normal pressure of the southwest wind? Our meteorologists make no effort to explain such circumstances, nor how it is that from the direction of the North Pole, 
where the sun's rays are certainly not very powerful, such volumes of water and wind are generated. I will cite a case here of nature like that outlined. In 1926, there occurred the Miami disaster, a hurricane which swept the coast of Florida and damaged the West Indian islands. I shall show that, small relatively as was this particular event, among other things, it broke up an anti-cyclone in the British Isles and caused violent convulsions in the weather. The explanation of these matters I shall submit was the sudden entry into our atmosphere of a meteor which fell in the ocean, set up a tidal wave, and whose gases condensed into water. In the following and other cases, it will simplify matters if the facts are briefly tabulated. <laughs>